Now, the main event. I'm really proud to introduce my friend Kathy Grant. She's spoken to us once before about Number Two Construction Battalion Band, and she had a lot of great information about our First World War heroes who recently were acknowledged for their service and sacrifice. Uh, Kathy is a 2022 recipient of a Queen's Platinum Jubilee Medal for her work on the National Apology Advisory Committee as co-chair of the History Subcommittee. She's uh, recently received Mary Matilda Winslow Award for Advocacy and Public Education from the Ontario Black History Society, and that was in 2022. In 2020, she received and was named one of the 100 Accomplished Black Canadian Women in the History category, and Kathy worked at Thomas Street Middle School as a researcher historian for the creation of the Black Canadian Veterans website, which was launched in November 2021. Now, just a little backstory about Kathy personally. She was born in Montreal to Barbadian immigrants, and she's a public historian, founder of Legacy Voices, which ensures black Canadian history is documented and preserved. And I've witnessed m a number of Kathy's educational presentations, and she always has the students eating out of the palm of her hand, bringing rich information that they probably have never heard before, reflecting the greatness of their particular race. Kathy has made educational presentations to municipalities, schools, and community organization, and she works to promote an inclusive approach to storytelling and historical documentation. She was invited by the French Embassy in Ottawa to attend the 95th anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge, and subsequently invited by the War Museum in Ottawa to present her Number 2 Construction Battalion Great War exhibit for the 100th anniversary of the Number 2 on Remembrance Day in 2016. So this is work that Kathy's been doing over the decades, and, and she'll tell you the story. I don't know if she'll tell you today, but she, she's, she makes known the story of how uh, in his dying days, her father had her promise to do this work, and she's honored um, his promise and then some with these marvelous displays. And so she's undertaken extensive research on the contributions of African Canadians in the First and Second World War and has assisted Veterans Affairs Canada in the development of the department's commemorative resources on the military service of black Canadians. And I will also tell you that she's feverishly busy correcting the record <laughs> in so many places where they have the story wrong or the images don't match the Canadian history. So she's a very, very busy person. And uh, afterwards, I want to tell you about a project that um, we're fundraising for. But right now, let's hear from the great historian, public archivist, Kathy Grant. Good morning, everyone. It is absolute pleasure for me to go and present today. It's been a very busy month. Um, just on Friday, I presented at a school in Oakville on uh, the contributions of black Canadians in history, as well as on number two, Construction Battalion. A lot of our presentations are very interactive. We would go and give out um, little time capsules, like little uh, bottles that you might get from the dollar store, and we would have them write on the bottle one person in black Canadian history that they know of, and it can't be Viola Desmond, it can't be Harriet Tubman, because most people know about these individuals. So we would also time them and say, okay, you have five minutes to go and um, write the name of someone, and then they had to go and share the name of the person as well as what they did in history. So some of them would come back, can we say Martin Luther King said, no, you can't. And then they will come back and they will go and they will list someone who they know. And on Friday, there were some people that I said, well, you know what, a lot of people know about these stories, but I'm glad that they had learned it. One of them was Lincoln Alexander, who was a World War II veteran and he went on to be Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. Another person that they recognized was um, the Honorable Jean Augustine. Which, which I was very happy. But one person who they mentioned was someone by the name of Violet King, who was like, the first uh, black graduate, female black graduate of law, which I was surprised that they knew that person. And um, there was about maybe 25, 30 people in the class, but they were able to identify seven people in black Canadian history, which I think is great progress because it, um, the last few years, 
I'd go and they'd only be able to recognize one or two. Um, another uh, point that we did at the school was uh, the Canadian Mint recently launched a coin in honor of number two construction battalion, which is a segregated battalion. And we were able to show a coin, the actual coin, I actually have it in that, that suitcase. So what we do with the students, we say, okay, we put, we'll put the suitcase on a table and we'll get them to open it. And they'll go and they'll pull out one object or two objects or three objects. And in the, in the suitcase, and it's in the suitcase currently, there are three coins that the Mint did in regards to black Canadian history. One was number two, Construction Battalion. One was um, Oscar Peterson, which was done last year. And another one was the Underground Railroad. And what is unique about the two coins for number two, Construction Battalion, as well as for um, the Underground Railroad, was that it was designed by a young man in Scarborough by the name of Kwame Delfish. And he has designed three coins for the Mint. I, I haven't known of anybody who's done like two, but he's done three coins. I met him at the Ontario Black History Society where I got an award for public education, the Mary Matilda Award, and he was there. And I said, you know what, we're doing an event at the War Museum next week and we want you to come. And he just kind of like shook his head and says, yes, yes, we'll find a way that you can come. So I, would, I knocked on a couple of fence doors, said, can you make a donation, can you make a donation? We want to bring him to the event at the War Museum. And people donated, we covered his transportation, we covered his hotel, and at the event at the War Museum, we had an enlarged coin that we got from the Mint. So that was like the backdrop. So everybody who was there was able to see it and was made available like, online for everybody to see. And um, just yesterday, um, the TTC, uh, they have their Black History um, Month um, draped buses and streetcars. And in the uh, subway themselves, they have images. So they had a walking tour that they had in one of those draped buses where we gathered at this uh, place called a different book, this cultural center is now called Blackhurst. So there was about maybe 40 kids that were there and adults. And what we would do is that we would go to each of the different locations. Um, we started off at Bathurst and Bloor with someone by the name of Beverly Maskell. So we talked a bit about her. She was an entrepreneur who came up from uh, Nova Scotia, and she started off, um, I guess, like selling out of her car, and she ended up making millions of dollars, like selling uh, cosmetics. And we had elders come out and talk about um, Beverly Maskell, and we would have like, the children go and read the plaque that was dedicated to her. We also had music, someone by the name of Sharmi Deller, I think Sheila knows her, I don't know if she's ever had, did she come here? Okay, so she, was, she also performed, and she performed A Change Is Gonna Come. She also performed this, this uh, personal story of hers called Story, about how you have to go and uh, continue, even if people put you down. Um, we stopped off at a skating rink called the Harry Gary Skating Rink, and Harry Gary was um, a man who, whose son went to a skating rink back in like the late 40s, um, early 50s, and was denied him and a, a young Jewish person, if their last name was Jabez or Habas, and they were denied because um, he was black. And then years later, they had a skating rink honoring him. So part of the journey, and we started off at um, Bloor and Bathurst, and we took the bus from Bloor and Bathurst down to Dundas and Bathurst, we also went to um, 20 Cecil Street. And 20 Cecil Street is, um, there's a, there, there, there was a plaque honoring Donald Moore. And Donald Moore uh, was uh, born in Barbados and he came up to Canada and he was like an entrepreneur. But he was also responsible for getting Canada to modify its restrictive immigration laws in 1954. So in April of 1954, he journeyed to Ottawa with a number of individuals to get them to modify the laws as it pertained to people of color coming into Canada. And what was spawned out of that 
was um, the domestic scheme where uh, women from the, Cari from the Caribbean would come up to Canada and work in a home for a year and at the end of the year they would be able to um, get their citizenship. One thing that uh, was somewhat surprising to most of the people on the trip was that someone had stolen the plaque. The plaque had been there since the year 2000 and last year somebody stole the plaque. So it's just, um, it's, like a, it's like a bronze plaque that they just removed it so it's just like the shell. So I knew that they had removed it. Um, I don't think that they were aware of it. But the city has um, agreed, they put funding to um, replace the plaque. Um, the company that made the original plaque is no longer in business, but the new plaque will have a picture as well as a story of, um, of Donald Moore. And some people were wondering, why would someone remove the plaque? It's a part of history. It's been undisturbed for like tw almost 20 years. But what, was, what happened, I think, about the year before, there was a building that was purchased on um, two doors down, and it was purchased by Black Lives Matter. So I don't know if that was a reason why they said, well, they're thinking that there might be too much black history or something, I don't know. But um, it was somewhat disturbing to go and see that happen. Um, I'm going to have, I forgot your name, sir, John, um, uh, show, uh, that's a website that we pre created called Black Canadian Veteran Stories. And it's an offset of our Facebook page. We have like over 11,000 members on our Facebook page. But teachers were saying that they could not have Facebook in the classroom. So we got in contact with a principal by the name of Scott Moody. Uh, he's a middle school teacher. He's also the Lieutenant Colonel of Queen's Own Rifles. So we contacted him and said, well, can you apply for funding to Veterans Affairs so that we could create a website. So if you scroll down a little bit. Okay, so it has me and um, Scott Moody is also a historian. And um, kids today, they're more into Instagram than they are Facebook. Um, but if you click here, you'll see all the videos. So we have a number of videos where we talk about black Canadian history as well as we have students as well who would tell stories. So the person on the far left, um, Matthew Wilson, like he's talking about um, a soldier by the name of Corporal Jimmy Post who was an underage soldier who um, he got the Distinguished Conduct Medal at the Battle of Passchendaele and he was a bit of a troublemaker, but he was, also, he was always a good soldier. And um, when he got on leave in Paris after being in Passchendaele, um, he punched a, a, a gendarme in, in the face because he was dancing the can-can with lady friends. So he went back to um, his commanding officer and they said that they're going to court-martial him. And he said, well, you can't court-martial me um, I'm underage. So um, he, had, he had his um, birth certificate just in case with um, one of his girlfriends in England and they actually got a copy of that and brought it back. And the person who was his commanding officer was um, Gregory Clark. And Gregory Clark was um, in both, was, a, was part of the, the fourth Canadian Mounted Rifles in the First World War. He was also a journalist for, um, for the Toronto Star. And in his records, and his records are donated to Library and Archives Canada, and he actually mentions the story of James Post about three or four times. <laughs> and um, another thing with um, uh, James Post, he was Catholic. And he tells a story um, about how when one of his friends was sinking in the mud and how he had to sit down and um, like pray next to him because they couldn't bring him out. And uh, he was there with the Padre and they bonded the Padre as well as James Post. And no one was allowed to swear in front of the Padre or James Post would, um, would beat them up. But there's like little stories like this, like there's not so much the glorification of war, but it's individual personal stories that we find connect with students. That's what we try to do 
as much as possible. Um, there's uh, one there. Uh, the number two construction battalion, Jane, uh, June Paris. I don't know if it will, if it will play. The poem by George Borden is called The Black Soldier's Lament. The bugle called and forth we went to serve the crown our backs far bent. And build what ear that must be done but near to fire an angry gun. No heroes we nay, not one. With deep lament we did our job despite the shame our manhood wrought. We built and fixed and fixed again to prove our worth as proud black men and hasten shore the Kaiser's end. From Scotia Port to Seaford Square, across to France, the conflict there. At Ville La Joie and Place Peron, for God and King to right the wrong. The number two, 600 strong, stripped to the waist and sweated chest. Midday's reprieve, much needed rest. We dug and hauled and lifted high from trenches deep toward the sky, non-fighting troops and yet we die. The peace restored, the battle won. Black sweat and toil had beat the hunt. Black blood was spilled, black bodies maimed. For medals brave, no black was named. Yet proud we were, our proud unchained. But time we bring forth other wars, then give to us more daring chores, that we might prove our courage strong, preserve their right, repel the wrong, and proud will sing the battle song. That is George Borden and he advocated for the apology that happened uh, this past summer honoring number two construction battalion as well as saying an apology for the racism that they experienced. This picture here was taken at Queen's Park in 1920 and it was honoring the men who died in number two construction battalion. And there's a plaque that's on the second floor of the legislature um, that honors them. And I took a tour of the legislature back in October and I asked where was the plaque and the person who was doing the tour didn't know. I said, well, we would like it to be part of the tour when you go to um, Queen's Park. So now it's part of the tour. Um, on the 1st of January, I went to um, the Lieutenant Governor's levy and they had a little cabinet where they had a bit of the story of number two construction battalion. And I said, well, there's some errors in here um, is there a way that you can correct it going forward? So now we're working with um, the Lieutenant Governor's office to go, not Lieutenant Governor, but Queen's Park to go and correct the errors that are in there. Um, there's another school that we've been working with called the York Region District School Board. And a couple of years ago, we connected with them because they uh, would follow us on Facebook and uh, we created the website. But then they wanted to do something to honor number two construction battalion. So they created this thing called the Google Map. So they took all of the records from um, where the number two construction battalion enlisted and plotted them on a map. So the kids can go and create their own little profile on whoever they're researching. And the records are tied to um, the military records at Library and Archives Canada. Also, um, <coughs> in terms of teaching and getting um, primary sources. Last year, I was on a committee with Sheila as part of the National Apology Advisory Committee for Number Two Construction Battalion. And um, what I wanted was for Live and Archives Canada to digitize all of the administrative records that are linked to Number Two Construction Battalion. And there was a bit of resistance, but I was very firm. Um, I got in contact with someone by the name of Leslie Weir who's a head librarian at Live and Archives Canada, and she authorized those records. So those records were made available. There are over 3,000 records. They're available online so that um, educators and teachers, when they go to site, they can, have, they can cite the resources that are at Live and Archives Canada. And in those records that are at Live and Archives Canada, they tell the story of some of the struggles that members of the black community um, faced in enlisting. And um, they have a story, or they have an individual by the name of Eubern Greenidge. And Eubern Greenidge was a uh, soldier, but well before he was a soldier, 
he was going to the University of Manitoba to study medicine. And he was in his fourth year, and he uh, came out of that to go and register for number two construction battalion. And when he got overseas, um, the Canadian government actually sent him back so that he could finish his studies. But uh, one thing that's disturbing when we went to Live in Archives Canada, when we saw the recruiting, there was a record that showed that when he went to enlist and you have to have a medical, um, they had a civilian doctor um, examine him. And the medical doctor from the army said, well, I'm glad that you're examining the N-word. And it's right there in the records. So the recruiting officer sent a note to, um, like I said, the chief of staff saying, well, it's this type of experience that members of the black community um, have that is deterring them from joining because they're super sensitive. Um, there, there's just so many, I guess, like examples of, I guess, um, I guess, like racism that they experience. But there's also positive stories. And I know that a lot of times uh, people would say that their accommodations were poor. Um, their accommodations weren't poor. They lived in huts. There was heating in the huts. And if you were to compare that to living in the trenches, um, there, 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 there's no comparison. So we want to tell the story accurately as possible. And that's what um, part of our, our research is doing and also sharing, I guess, like the myths with teachers. So we find now that if teachers um, observe something, they'll come back and say, well, I don't think that this is true, Kathy. Can you take a look at it? And then I'll say, well, no, it's not. It's not true. And then they will go and make sure that their students know that. And when the students have to go and do their research, they have to cite their, cite their sources. Um, there's another teacher by the name of Serena Virk who wrote a book honoring um, Number 2 Construction Battalion for children. And um, the same principal, Scott Moody, saw it and said, well, he noticed errors. And then he put her in contact with me. And I said, well, there are all of these errors. And they had sold, I think, 200 books to Peel District School Board. And she said, well, I don't want wrong information there. And she said, you know what? She doesn't want them given out. So um, and, and it was out of her cost. It cost her thousands of dollars to go and produce those books. So she said, you know what? Integrity means something to me. So um, we put her in contact with myself and other members, someone by the name of Matthias Jost, who spent like 30 years, and he was the Director of History and Heritage at the Department of Defense, and we went through that with her. The actual uh, publication is gonna come out next month, but we we're just um, very pleased to know that this person uh, had the integrity to make sure that the correct information was there. We also found out that a, that a small bookstore had some copies as well, and she went to the bookstore and she said, you know what, I will replace them when the book comes out. So um, when we notice that, it makes, um, it makes my heart, just, it's almost like a hug that people are interested in that. Um, another thing that we do uh, is we have a lot of images of soldiers. We have a lot of connections, like whether it's through Facebook or word of mouth, where people will share their images. And we will make sure that these images go out to the school. And a lot of times we have the children say, well, can we have a helper? So right now I'm going to ask for two helpers here to help unveil one of these. So this is the actual um, Queen's Park. So we got in contact with um, the Toronto Archives and we asked if we could have this copy. And it's such a powerful image. And what we do with this, uh, we sometimes share this image with schools so they can see as well. And a lot of these, these um, 
children here were part of the churches that were involved. So there was like the British Methodist Episcopal Church. There was the First Baptist Church that was there. And some of these are soldiers that survived that came here. And when I posted this picture, um, someone in Brantford said, you know what, my grandfather uh, was one of the ministers involved and she had the actual um, invitation to this event. So um, I got her to go and send me a copy and I told her, well, you know what, it's in, s in low resolution, go to the library and um, get me a copy in high resolution. So one of the images there in that second set And she still had, she had it, and I was like, really surprised. And it talks about who was there, um, who, who some of the members were in the, in the picture. And that's the family at the end. And a lot of these images, um, it's, I guess it's surprising for a lot of people because they expect to see members of our community wearing types of rags. And you see like the difference. A lot of them, I guess, they would get dressmakers or they would sew. And you just see how regal, how regal they look. There. And the person there who's on the top corner, um, his name was J.R.B. Whitney, who was a publisher in, uh, in Toronto. And his wife was one of the first black teachers in the Windsor um, area. going to show the next um, URL link, which is from the York Region District School Board, where it talks a bit about um, the MAP project as well as students interacting with it. And um, many of the members that were on there, okay, so this is it here. You just press the button. Yes, please. So the Wired USB Museum and Archives created a Google My Map on the number two construction battalion, which was Canada's first and only segregated uh, battalion in the First World War. So we've created this resource so that we can have students explore a digital resource that connects with geography, history, and even literacy to help them better understand the past. So using historical thinking concepts such as the ethical dimensions of history and historical significance, students can really start to build a picture of what it was like for Black Canadians here during the First when we were talking with Kathy about this opportunity with the Google My Map, she said, let's partner, like, let's start bringing these stories, the research that I know, um, into life. And, um, and so we've been working with Kathy to really research these soldiers, um, tell these soldier stories, um, and, and have students find out more about them. It's important for, I guess, like Canadians and students to, to know about the contributions of uh, Canadians that volunteered to fight for Canada in all the wars. Even uh, prior to when Canada became a nation, they were patriotic. They wanted to serve. They loved their country. They loved their families. Um, I know for, I guess, in the First and Second World War, a lot of these men, like, they joined to make things better for their families. Students should learn about the history of the battalion and about the apology because this is Canadian history. The history of um, black soldiers, it's, it's been hidden. As a member that's been serving in the Canadian forces for over three decades, when I joined to, to see people that looked like me, it was only people in the very lower ranks that, that I saw. And to hear about men of number two, that was unheard of. 
When I was first approached by the Museum and Archives to implement or try this out in the classroom, I was really interested and I was very intrigued because this project allows students to um, make intersections between digital technology and historical information and to plot those you know, points on a map digitally and visually is very helpful for our students learning. And my students are going to put together a website based on what they've researched on their particular soldier and this is all happening in, ahead of Remembrance Day so that they can share their findings with their classmates and other students in the school. We were learning about black uh, soldiers and the government didn't treat them right and they said you can't be in the army and then a couple years later they finally said yes but they put them into labor work. So far we learnt on how not all of them were accepted to be in war even if they voluntarily wanted to be in the war. It was really cool to see a lot of the artifacts and the pictures that they brought in. So at first they weren't allowed to actually join the war and then two years later they were allowed but they didn't get to fight. They were doing more other jobs so they were building railroads and carrying cargo and stuff like that. Well we're in partners and we're gonna uh, focus on one specific uh, person and we all have different ones and we'll basically be focusing on them and learning about what they did and how long they were in the army for and you know all the stuff about them. Um, I really like the map tool because I find it really interesting to see where a lot of the soldiers came from um, and kind of like their past and I really like how you can personalize it and make it your own. I think it's important just to like acknowledge those those soldiers who were cheated unfairly and poorly. I think that it's really important to learn about the construction battalion um, to just kind of appreciate kind of what they did and their contributions to the war even though it, a lot of people may not have know about it so kind of spreading awareness which I think is really important. It's important that students learn about number two construction battalion because it shows I guess the determination of these soldiers uh, to serve it shows their patriotism. Um, a lot of times when you learn about First World War history, you don't see examples of members of the black community. It's time for the educators to realize that they should not just maintain the status quo of telling the history from somebody else's perspective of how it's been told over the years, but now it's time to change the game. Change the game and tell the history Tell Canadian history the way it is, and a part of Canadian history is about number two construction battalion. Is about number two construction battalion. Okay. At the time that was put out, I think it was about like 5,000 individuals who had accessed that video. Now I think there's about, I could say, 10,000 who's accessed the website itself. So more and more individuals are looking to uh, find out about that. So with here, with this website, um, you can s we have like about maybe like 40 uh, different profiles of individuals. I don't know if you can scroll up. There's like a three line search where it's an article one. And uh, so that's my dad in the middle and then Ainsworth Dyer, and then John Olby. So John Olby just turned 100 last year, and he passed away. He was part of this documentary that we did called Black Liberators World War II, and it, we just got nominated for a screen actors um, thing for editing, so it was like myself and other person. And um, so if you click on my dad, So if you scroll down, so each profile tells about the soldier themselves. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see my dad. Yeah, he, he also did, he, yeah, he's also a boxer. And he's also a diplomat as well. Uh, he was like the Minister of External Affairs for the Barbados government. So after, um, after the Second World War, he's both the Army as well as the RCAF. He went on to Sir George Williams College and then McGill, and he got his master's in social work, and then he did a series of other jobs. And then he was a diplomat, and um, he was at the OAS in Washington, 
and then he found the whole um, diplomatic piece very um, pretentious, and he gave it up, and he, was, he went on to become the head of social development at the Prison for Women in Kingston. Um, that, that ended my mom and dad's marriage because my mom was used to a certain type of lifestyle, and living in Kingston was not it for her. <laughs> But um, <coughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't a prison guard, though. he was like the head of social development. No, I mean, okay. Your yeah, so it was, it, was, it, was, it was different. If you scroll up a little bit, um, there should be a link, tribute to my father. So if you can click on the link that says tribute to my father. Yes, you did. So we did this for the War Museum um, last year. Land of my birth, O oh dares earth, so my dad beneath whose shining skies I toil, to fight for I Canada must now 19. leave thy sacred soil, and risk my blood on foreign lands, to free thee from the harsh demands which tyrants harshly would impose, if none to freedom's call arose. I go with warm tears in my eyes, for I shall miss thy smiling skies, the rapture of thy myriad stars. Those festive nights with so many bears, my love, and all that I hold there, which just in dreams and can now in the RCA be there. In Edmonton. Land of my birth, so filled with That is not my mom. I go, <laughs> and I may not return. But fires of my love shall burn for thee, bright as thy noonday sun, sure as a victory to be won. When he went to Sir George Williams, and this is him at McGill doing his master's in social work. And that's his graduation. These are domestics in Montreal, left the immigration officer. And that's my dad, Bill Davis. And he's like graduates from the University of McGill. That's the wedding going off of him. My dad and West Indian soldiers at his office on the 20th anniversary of them, um, they settled in Montreal. And that's the old Canadian flag. And that's my dad laying a wreath with Senator Ann Poole in the year 2000. And that's from my dad. And that's a plaque at the War Museum honoring the West Indian soldiers that fought for Canada. It's, it's in the lobby of the War Museum now. And that's me teaching kids about matters. And the person who did this video um, is Eric Grunt. I actually met him online through Facebook. And he wanted to go and interview black veterans who's out in BC. And he drove all the way from BC to interview one of our veterans in Brockville. Ontario wow. and um, and he's actually now part of part of our team and he has interviewed like over 400 World War II, it's close to 500 World War II veterans across Canada, all nationalities and he is just like 28 years old now and um, yeah so we put him in contact with the War Museum, he actually has like a contract with the War Museum and it's going to be like the Eric Brunt collection. So. Yeah, talk 